Um, with that, I want to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Alan Guttmacher of the National Institute for Child Health and Development. I do want to say Dr. Guttmacher and I served together on the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, um, and he and I worked together to get the IACC Strategic Plan for Autism Research to include as one of its objectives conducting a symposium workshop on ethical, legal, and social issues in autism research. So if not for him, much of this conversation would not be occurring. Dr. Guttmacher. Well, thank you. That may be the nicest introduction area I've ever had, so thank you. Uh, and I, th I thank uh, the folks who organized this meeting for asking me to be part of it, um, less because I have a chance to say to you what I'm about to say, but more to be able to just hear this conversation, which really has already been a very rich and, uh, for me, a rewarding one. So thank, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, prenatal testing, and I thought uh, since it's come up earlier in the discussion that good ethics is based on good science and a good understanding of the social context in which the science is occurring, that I would take the first half of my eight minutes or so and talk about what I see as some of the sort of scientific basis and something of the social context for prenatal testing as it might, as it relates currently and as it may relate in the future to uh, autism, and then bring up uh, what I see as some of the multiple ethical issues that this raises. And again, this will just be a partial list of some of the sort of the facts and of the ethical issues. I'm sure there are others that folks in, the, in this room can, can add to it. So just thinking about the sort of the who, what, when, why, et cetera, of uh, prenatal testing, some things just to put out on the table. Uh, that um, there, is a, there is a when to this. Uh, many people, when they think of prenatal testing, uh, mean or certainly think about testing that's done during the pregnancy, and that is one type of prenatal testing. There's <laughs> other kind of truly prenatal testing, that is uh, what's sometimes called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, when you take a fertilized egg very early in the process and using artificial reproductive means before it's even been implanted in the uterus to be able to select um, for certain genetic aspects of, the, uh, of that embryo to take out part of the embryo that may not, or the multiple embryos to select basically an embryo that has the desired genetic constituency, whatever that might be. There's also, in fact, at least theoretically, the idea of of prenatal genetic testing that's e or testing that's even previous to that, and that is selecting an individual sperm or egg for fertilization that has a certain genetic makeup. Now that's getting a little bit more sort of sci-fi at the moment, um, but is something that technically would be possible um, more widely in the not too distant future. So as we think about some of the issues, they're perhaps somewhat different for each of those different kinds of uh, of prenatal testing. In terms of the what, most prenatal testing that we're certainly talking about, though there are some other forms of it, is genetic prenatal testing. That is looking at certain genes, et cetera. Um, there are other kinds of prenatal testing, for instance, using uh, ultrasound during pregnancy to look at the fetus structurally and to get some ideas. But usually when people are talking about this, they're thinking about looking at the genetic makeup of the egg, the sperm, or the fetus in terms of doing this. But even there, there's a distinction, and I think a very important one for what we're particularly focusing on, and that is when many people think about this, they're thinking about it for a condition that is almost wholly genetic in its etiology and very simple to understand. The model of that might be cystic fibrosis. The only way to have cystic fibrosis is to have mutations in both copies of the gene that we all have that has to do with cystic fibrosis. So if you have no mutations in those genes or only one mutation in the two genes, you will not have cystic fibrosis. There's no other way to have it. So one can make the diagnosis with some confidence based upon the genetics of the fetus. Is this a fetus that would have cystic fibrosis or not? I would argue that with autism, of course, that is not the case. We'll come back to that in terms of some of the ethical issues here. Um, uh, another um, way that the what uh, kind of varies is that today that kind of prenatal testing is simply to say, is this genetic variation present or absent? 
One can imagine a future not that far off, but sort of where genetic engineering would be possible so that one could see this variation in the embryo, for instance, and go in prenatally and change that variation in almost um, in, in a multitude of different ways. So again, not currently feasible, but in the not too distant future feasible. In terms of the uh, who, you know, who undergoes uh, prenatal testing? Well, it varies. Some prenatal testing is done sort of on a population basis. That is simply that there is some kind of uh, something that people are worried enough about that is common enough that it's sort of offered to all comers. There is other prenatal testing which is based upon a family history or heightened concern about a certain condition or something, usually because of family history, um, which again there makes it for a very different social context because the parents in that latter situation have some experience with this condition for which um, the, sc the screening is offered, and undoubtedly their own attitudes, some would say biases, experiences, et cetera, et cetera, that come to the table. The why of uh, prenatal testing? Well, the most obvious one that people think about is it's a decision about whether to create um, a pregnancy with a specific genetic makeup or whether to terminate, on the other hand, a pregnancy with a specific genetic makeup, and that's probably the most common reason. But sometimes it's done simply because people want to know before the child's birth exactly what is in store to the degree that genetics tells us anything about what's in store for people. Simply to be ready ahead of time, sometimes that can be if there's a family history of severe um, newborn cardiac anomalies, it can be done to make sure that there'll be some cardiologist available as soon as the child is born to help out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the how of this, I think, is important, uh, the how and the where, and I'll kind of link those. Usually, genetic testing is done um, in the context of genetic counseling, that is, someone who is trained um, to understand the genetics of this and also somewhat trained in counseling to talk <coughs> with the uh, couple that are involved about what exactly this information means, very importantly, what, it, what are the limits of that knowledge, and I'll come back to that in a minute and it's usually done in a major medical center kind of thing, et cetera. One can imagine, again, a future where, and this was not five years off, but a future where this kind of thing might be available direct to the consumer, where pregnant couples might literally be able to do their own prenatal diagnosis because it turns out that some fetal cells escape into the, the mother's um, blood circ her circulation, and you can harvest those cells and Eventually, one could imagine a way that people could do that at home if they wanted to and do home-based gen prenatal genetic testing. I think that's a number of years away. So what are some of the ethical issues? And I imagine just by my going through that, you've already raised about 17 or 20 in your own mind, so let me just hit a few of the ones that occur to me in the probably three minutes I have left. Um, one is that clearly in this situation, the decision makers are the parents. And it's solely the parents that are making the decision. And they're making it in the context of not even having the potential individual there to look at, to be part of the conversation, the consideration, whatever. Um, it may be that a fetus is present, and that certainly has some psychological impact upon people. But clearly, this is a decision being made by the parents without any input from the fetus, uh, et cetera, that would, uh, that would be affected by this. Um, the second, of course, is that each parent individually, let alone the couple together, will bring very varying personal, religious, other kinds of attitudes and clearly life experiences to this, including whether there is a family history, whatever this condition is, uh, to this kind of conversation. You know, the eugenics we've already heard mentioned, eugenics of the past tended largely to be sort of state-generated, you know, thou shalt not, uh, and as Ari correctly pointed out, the North Carolina experience uh, that's in the Times today, et cetera. I would suggest that the eugenics in most parts of the world today is not state-based eugenics, it's individual-based. It's individual folks making decisions about um, reproductive future, et cetera, et cetera, which brings up, I think, another s a variety of questions. Other kinds to think about are clearly uh, the limitations of knowledge. People tend to overinterpret uh, what um, 
uh, what it, partial knowledge, I tend to think that is full knowledge. So saying something about even if you knew for sure about whether a particular fetus um, would go on to have autism, uh, well, what does it mean to have autism, which obviously this group has great expertise. What do, what do you mean exactly to parents if you say that? Where on the autism spectrum might this individual fall in terms of what various attributes, et cetera? Uh, and in fact, can you even say, with what degree of certain, can you even say that this individual would fall any place on the autism spectrum? So the limitations in knowledge are hugely important. This question about who gives the counseling, the folks who give the counseling often have very little experience about uh, what it truly means to live as, uh, with autism. And so uh, how is that part of the conversation that uh, folks are entering into when they're thinking about prenatal testing? Uh, and I've got a few others, but well, let, let me just close with one more because I've been waved at before. Uh, and that is it's already come up, and I know it's going to come up again in a few minutes, the question about socioeconomic stratification here. Um, that the kind of things we're talking about certainly today in society are not uh, equally accessible and available to people of different educational background, different socioeconomic background, et cetera. Um, there's racism in our healthcare system, et cetera. So uh, to what degree um, does that enter and raise a whole host, I would argue, of ethical questions when we, st when we think about prenatal testing? So with that, I think just hitting my time mark, I will sit down. Extraordinary presentation, uh, as anticipated. Um, I believe our next presenter is um, Brian Falls and Dr. Omar. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ha. Uh, ha, yeah. ha, thank you. Brian, I'm uh, I'm sitting in for for both Brian, me, and Dr. Burstein. Brian, Brian uh, is at a baby, er, new baby parenting training. He paid a lot and he couldn't get out of it, so. Um, thank you. All right, so um, let's see. So we're, 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 we uh, are going to be asking a certain number of questions related to prescribing practices and uh, risk management, ethical decision making as regards to pharmacology. So we're the, uh, I guess, the shrinks in the room, or the doctors in the room. So we want to uh, continue this conversation. And, um, uh, you know, what we talked about yesterday was really uh, helpful for us as we develop this paper and try and um, toss out a few questions and also try and, uh, this is an ongoing paper for us. So we want to hear a little bit more about what uh, you all think are the most interesting or controversial aspects of these uh, prescribing practices. So. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, aspects of informed consent, um, efficacy and safety of different um, possible drugs, and also uh, undue influence from pharmaceutical marketing, things like that. So this is a broad sweeping uh, topical survey of certain questions that we'd like to develop further. So um, as we know in the past, there's been tons, sorry if I'm speaking too loud, there's been tons of uh, possible interventions that have been uh, Propose some some quacky and some uh, less quacky, and um, it seems that a lot of the interventions are either behavioral or pharmacological, and uh, the pharmacological ones have been kind of multiplying in the last number of decades, uh, irrespective of their known efficacy or FDA approval. So, uh, for example, I think yesterday we were talking about oxytocin, which is also now a new candidate drug that is uh, in the pipeline and whether or not that actually uh, represents uh, what it uh, seems to represent or whether it's uh, even if efficacious, useful at all is another question. So, uh, we, you know, as normally characterized uh, as having certain, people with ASDs are often characterized as having certain deficits that might lead into problems uh, within family situations and within uh, the ability to consent and whether or not one is, uh, I guess, uh, non-speaking or, or so. Um, communication problems might enter into treatment decisions. Uh, 
And uh, all these factors come together with many different possible conflicts of interest. So one of the things, uh, as I said, we're going we're gonna to address is what we do know about uh, efficacy and safety. And then um, we, ha we have a larger project on undue uh, influence of pharmaceutical companies in marketing. So we'll try and tie a little bit of that into this and um, how that might affect risk management strategies and how to think about informed consent. So what we know of the available treatments, um, the medications that are often prescribed are prescribed for sometimes nonspecific uh, behavioral symptoms like uh, maladaptive behaviors, irritability, right? Um, non what they call non-core symptoms. And uh, behavioral treatments seem to be first line interventions, uh, assuming consent thr throughout all of this, of course. And uh, they, they seem to carry less risk than medications, obviously. So um, often a, a lot of you here work in uh, behavioral interventions and so on. And so um, the discussion about when or whether to use any of these or all of these is uh, part of the ongoing process. But uh, needless to say, pharmacotherapy is definitely more controversial of an option. Um, the kinds of things that get uh, brought up for potential treatment are things like inattention, hyperactivity, repetitive behaviors, irritability, um, and as, as many have mentioned, um, things that are often misunderstood as repetitive behaviors might actually be, uh, I think somebody mentioned this lapping, um, you know, it might be more of a problem for the observer than the participant. And so um, how these things are defined is a really important question. Um, but I think the core, the core issue is, is a the consent of the individual involved and whether there are uh, mediating influences or corrupting influences that threaten the consent process. Um, so presently, pretty much everything gets, gets prescribed in a particular way or another. Um, antipsychotics, stimulants, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and um, the two drugs that are approved are uh, antipsychotics, um, for example, Abilify. And so you have a lot of off-label prescribing and a lot of kind of idiosyncratic use of, of varieties of drugs. Uh, th that often outsteps the known safety and efficacy profiles. And so this is what raises concerns for people. Um, and then when, when people, uh, when physicians will often outstep kind of known guidelines, you often have uh, ex excessive dosing, um, as I said, off-label prescribing, polypharmacy, and um, these are very idiosyncratic, prescriber-dependent, institution-dependent. So it's, uh, as many of you know, it's not exactly, there's not exactly a streamlined process or even consensus on these questions. So some of the, some of the, the influences that you see outside of aut treatment for autism that are also relevant for autism are the ways in which studies are funded, um, the ways in which marketing happens online for doctors as prescribers, taking advantage of certain uh, psychological biases in, in human nature that, uh, for example, certain heuristics, anchoring. Um, we go into some of these in our paper. But um, oftentimes people are, people are uh, reimbursed for quick fixes, so social factors can compound the tendency to, to bias physicians towards medication. Um, uh, we know educational events, the medical literature itself, underreporting what, what, what was mentioned earlier as a file drawer problem, uh, negative results not being reported, um, funding for certain studies, not declaring conflicts of interest. These are pervasive problems within psychiatry and also within how uh, treatments for autism are, are articulated to the public. So within, the infor within informed consent, um, obviously decisional capacity will vary based on the individual. Um, communication ability, uh, clarity of communication and so on, uh, understanding risks and benefits of different treatments. But uh, ideally this was supposed to be a, a collaborative effort between patients, families, and uh, ideally representing the patient's best interest. Now we all know that uh, there are conflicts of interest between parents and children that are pervasive outside of treatment decisions and um, you know in evolutionary biology it's called parent offspring conflict and it's it's something you see in all uh, 
conflicts that, that arise in medical decision making. And so one, the basic point being you can't presume that the interests of uh, the child are the interests of the parent. Uh, they, don't, they don't often overlap. And so that's something that's very important, especially with a non-speaking patient. Um, other issues is that peop patients with uh, autism spectrum disorders often self don't self-present for, for care often. Often they're brought to the physician. And um, uh, this raises the, the question of, uh, thanks, yeah, uh, conflicts of interest. So ensuring the consent process is a really important uh, aspect of uh, prescribing medication. Um, and so in the end, people wind up kind of erring on the side of using medication only when there seems to be Im imminent dangerous to self or others or kind of severe impairment, uh, especially in situations in which uh, the patients don't have uh, adequate caring guardians or parents around. So in the end, uh, some of the, the things I think helpful recommendations are clearly identifying diagnoses and target symptoms, uh, careful documenting and clinic mo clinic and clinical monitoring, uh, thinking of consent as an ongoing process rather than something that's just done once and forgotten about. Um, you know, the progress of one's life will change over months or years and consent needs to be uh, an ongoing process. Um, documenting the consent process. Uh, thinking of medications not as just something to be started and forgotten about, but uh, can be used in short-term context, long-term context, being very sensitive to adverse effects and always weighing risks and benefits. Um, and in the end, always side, siding on the uh, Citing on the side of patients' autonomy and um, being also aware of the undue influence from uh, pharmaceutical marketing and things like that, that are that are basically beyond conscious comprehension. Okay, thanks. Very interesting and very exciting. Um, our next presenter is Shane Newmeyer. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Thank you very much, Shane. The floor is yours. And I apologize in advance for any mess I'm trying to do with the PowerPoint. Um, Um, my name is Shane Newmeyer. I'm a law student um, at Suffolk University interested in disability rights issues, and I'm going to be giving a presentation on aversives, starting with some definitions and a summary of the controversy and going into different um, legal avenues to address the problems with aversives, maybe legislation, international human rights law, and litigation theories. Um, to start with some definitions, um, aversive behavioral interventions are using pain or discomfort um, to control behavior, namely punishment. This includes, but is definitely not limited to, the use of restraint, which is limiting somebody's bodily emotion through medication, through devices such as restraint chairs or straps, um, and through physical or manual holds. Um, it includes seclusion, which is putting somebody in an enclosed space from which they can't um, get out by themselves. It includes contingent electric shock, which is basically um, responding to an unwanted behavior by um, giving them a short but high voltage electric shock. Food deprivation and um, sensory either deprivation or forced exposure to an unpleasant stimulus. Um, there is still ongoing controversy despite the lack of ed evidence in favor of aversives. Um, some parents and providers still maintain that this is sometimes the only effective treatment for the hardest cases as they see people with severe self-injurious um, or assaulted behaviors um, and that nothing else works to deal with certain individuals. And furthermore, 
even in uh, cases where it's not certain people, they maintain that sometimes staff need to protect themselves or others by making quick use of restraint or exclusion, especially in order to um, deal with an individual's destructive behavior. And finally, some will use a pro pragmatic argument, or so they think of that restraint and seclusion will inevitably happen at some point, so we might as well allow it and train for it when it does happen. On the other hand, the disability rights advocates have long opposed this, and many um, parents and providers do or have come to oppose the use of aversives on a number of grounds. First of all, contrary to what uh, proponents would say, uh, they, uh, they believe that um, aversives are ineffective over the long term and, sh and even the short term. Um, best practices in education and treatment sh clearly favor positive behavioral interventions, reward-based rather than punishment-based um, behavioral treatment. Um, aversives can be traumatic psychologically, they can be dangerous, they've resulted in deaths of people with disabilities on numerous occasions. They're often used not for dealing with assaultive behavior or um, self-injurious behavior, but purely for convenience or to enforce normalcy for completely innocuous behavior. And even aside from all these concerns, their very use is um, threatening to human rights and dignity. To address these concerns, there are some legal avenues currently, though um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there is no federal legislation yet. I will get to the legislation being proposed, but all the, le uh, the legislation and regulation right now is on a state-by-state -state basis, which means it's, in it's inconsistent, not only in what it allows for, but where it allows for schools, residential facilities, et cetera, who is in control of it, which state agencies, which departments, et cetera, uh, all kinds of things. And some states have regulations, some states have laws. Um, the difference being laws are through the um, state legislature, whereas state agencies put forth rules and regulations. Some states have both, and some, unfortunately, still have neither. The good news is that a number of states recently have taken interest in this issue because of government reports on residential facilities and schools and how they use especially restraint and seclusion, but um, also other reverses in some cases as well. Um, New Hampshire recently um, passed a restraint and seclusion law. I'm going to use the uh, registration RS for um, convenience here and it protects schools, uh, children in schools and residential facilities, and is in addition to existing regulation through state agencies uh, in New Hampshire about why or versus use, but provides special um, protection. Um, also recently, uh, in 2011, Massachusetts put forth regulations. Massachusetts has a bit of a special case for anybody who doesn't know. They have the only residential facility in the country, if not the world, that allows the use of contingent electric shock on people with um, developmental and other mental disabilities. Um, this is the Judge Rotenberg Center. So the Massachusetts regulations would ban certain aversives going forward, namely contingent electric shock, um, long-term restraint, seclusion, and food deprivation. But any existing cases, which at this point are all court-ordered, uh, will remain in effect. Um, those I individuals will continue to re receive aversives. However, Massachusetts is continue, uh, um, considering supplementing these with measures that would either completely ban these um, aversives in all cases, would further regulate them, would oversee them, or would at least require a licensing to use these um, techniques. A few other states are also considering putting forth regulations or statutes um, because of this new interest um, in addition. A couple of federal laws have been pa passed, one having to do with schools and the other having to do with residential facilities. The Schools Act is the Keeping All Students Safe Act, which ha primarily deals with uh, um, restraints, but also 
um, prohibits the use of aversives that would harm student, compromise student health and safety. And it would also um, require, training would require parents to be notified and would not allow um, aversives to be made a part of a student's plan or at least restrain and seclusion. Um, the residential facilities bill um, is the Stop Child Abuse and Residential Programs for Teens Act, which um, it limits some aversives, restraint and seclusion, and it prohibits others, um, food deprivation, medical services deprivation, sleep deprivation, and any humiliating or degrading um, physical or mental abuse. Um, it also makes requirements of staff, such as that they learn about and report child abuse and that they submit to background checks before employment. International human rights also addresses human rights concerns, but can't be used by themselves to uh, enforce it. A number of United States, uh, excuse me, United Nations treaties, um, na namely the International Con Convention on, in on Civil and Political Rights, the, international, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities prohibit torture, discrimination on the basis of protected groups like disability, um, promote the um, rights of people with disabilities and children and specifically children with disabilities to be involved in, the, in um, things affecting them um, and generally protects rights and dignities of both of these aforementioned groups. And in addition, due to a report by the, um, mental, the nonprofit group Mental Disability Rights International, the UN, through its special um, rapporteur, that is, an investigator and expert on torture, declared the use of certain things, namely continuing electric shock and long term restraint, to be torture as used by the Judge Rotenberg Center here in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, international human rights at this point isn't usable by itself. It's persuasive, but it's non-binding. It can't be enforced by itself in court. And the U.S. hasn't even signed on to a number of the treaties um, that protect the aforementioned rights. And the U.N. doesn't have other enforcement powers by itself when it comes to these rights. There are some litigation theories that are possible, and here are just a few. Um, others I would have to do more research on. One, uh, one of the ones that I've seen come up in passing a lot is parents or um, people themselves, um, people with disabilities themselves will sue on intentional tort or personal injury theories. False imprisonment, if used for seclusion, negligence, that kind of thing, um, and that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, another big thing that might be coming up is the Judge Rotenberg Center will be likely filing litigation against the new regulations um, that have been passed in Massachusetts. There's also um, federal civil rights law protecting constitutional rights that can be used against public entities and possibly, though not likely, some private entities as well as anti-discrimination law, namely the Americans with Disability Act, and possible other theories that I actually do not have time to go into. The Judge Rotenberg Center issue I mentioned is that in 1987, the state of Massachusetts agreed with the Judge Rotenberg Center to not interfere with their use of aversives to a certain extent, that the center could continue to use aversives, but it would have to go through a court order process to um, have individuals subject to um, long-term restraint, food deprivation, contingent electric shock, or seclusion, um, and with oversight of two committees, which, by the way, have been found not to have met, and the court process has been found to be more or less a rubber stamp. Um, this, uh, nonetheless, this court agreement has been successfully enforced against state agencies in the past. The regulations would change this, but the center is hoping to defeat them by bringing up a settlement agreement if they file litigation. And if it goes to appeal, this is when international human rights law could be used and all of these persuasive but non-binding arguments 
this is where they could be used to change the law. Um, finally, the Dis Department of Justice opened an investigation also last year about um, the, the possibility that the use of aversive, again, as due to the JRC, violates the Title III of the Americans with Disability Act, which um, prohibits private entities from discriminating in the kind of services they provide between, uh, on the basis of disability, namely that you wouldn't do this to a non-disabled person, so why are you doing it to people with disabilities? Um, and if, depending on the direction of this investigation, which is still unclear, this could result in a lawsuit by the Department of Justice, essentially against the Judge Rotenberg Center for its practices. Just as a note, last year the Department of Justice settled with the state of Georgia on a, an institutionalization issue, which resulted in um, the state of Georgia being forced to de do deinstitutionalization efforts by 2014, so this could have a potentially huge impact. Um, private lawsuits under the ADA are also a possibility, though this hasn't really come up thus far. The Federal Civil Rights Act, um, private entities that are acting in, uh, um, as the state does or the state itself can be sued for violation of um, a, a United States statute um, if they violate constitutional rights or rights under other laws. It's very hard to enforce, but there is case law that suggests that residential facilities, private residential facilities, in fact, can be held liable under this. Um, and this would be very special cases, I'm sorry. Um, and um, in the private sphere as well as public institutions. Um, there are some drawbacks to litigation, which I do not have time to discuss, but the good news is that there is momentum on this both in the um, sphere of litigation and in the sphere of uh, legislation, and this gives hope that what we all know about the rights and uh, lack of ex efficacy involved um, will be borne out through the law. Exceptional, and um, now our, our last presenter before the lunch period. Dr. Paul Shattuck, uh, you know, I can't remember what university you're from. I'm so sorry. Just keep your guess. Is there Washington a, is, is there a University in St. Louis. To, is there a video mute to turn off the projector? Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very grateful to ASAN, um, ADD, and Harvard for hosting and convening this event, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to be here and participate. Uh, when we think about the implications of research outcomes, then we must ask the question of implications for whom? To which segments of the autistic population do research findings apply? Autism, presumably, affects people from all corners of society, black and white, rich, poor, young, and old. And our conceptual models, our theoretical conceptual models in the world of research about human development are almost all, um, in one way or another, ecological and longitudinal. And what I mean is that they posit that your social context, your family, your community, your neighborhood, your school, influences your development. And they also posit that people change as they age. You're different at age three than you are at age 30. What your life looks like, what kinds of challenges you face, what kinds of opportunities you could benefit from are all fundamentally shaped by age, your place in the life course, and social context, your place in society. Furthermore, we live in an era marked by social trends that are remaking the fabric of our societies. The US population is becoming more demographically diverse, older, and more economically unequal over time. By 2023, the majority of children will be from racial and ethnic groups that are classified as minorities today. 
Overall, by 2042, the majority of the population will be comprised of people from groups we currently refer to as minorities. The percentage of the population aged 65 and older is expected to increase from about 13% today to about 20% in 2050. Indicators of economic inequality are also going up over time. Unfortunately, autism research has a poor track record when it comes to examining social context, social diversity, or the trajectory of development across life course. Um, Zoe Gross earlier made a great point about bias uh, being bad science with respect to interpreting results. I would also say that bias is bad for science when we think of sampling and research participation. If this continues, then autism research risks diminishing relevance in the face of ongoing social, demographic, and economic changes. Ari pointed out um, at the outset, posed a question about what should we be aiming to accomplish um, as, as a fundamental ethical question to consider for the day. And I would say that we want to be building a base of evidence that is in service of the larger goal of creating high quality, equitable supports and services for all people with an autism spectrum disorder and their families. And I have three specific recommendations that I'd like to advance for discussion. First is to increase funding for research across the lifespan, including adulthood. The majority of a typical life unfolds in, adult in adulthood, yet the vast majority of autism research remains firmly fixed on very early childhood. S this is inequitable from a life course perspective, um, but I would also say it's bad science. Scientists and supporters of science must ask about the opportunity cost of only examining early childhood. What fundamental basic discoveries about the nature of human development and autism itself do we risk not making by avoiding studying autism across the life course into adulthood? Second, we need to raise the bar for research funding grantees people who receive funding for autism research. Um, there needs to be an increase in expectations for grantees to recruit racially and socioeconomically diverse samples into their studies. Third, I think that on the science, on the publication side of science, um, editorial standards, there also needs to be a raising of the bar, increasing of expectation. Uh, we need to require authors to adhere to basic guidelines about reporting the socio-demographic characteristics of research participants in autism research, um, and a review of, of research on services for adults with autism that's coming out um, early next year. We reviewed uh, almost three dozen studies, and it was remarkable to us as we were reviewing these studies that the vast majority of them don't even report um, the, the socio-demographic and racial income, so forth, characteristics of study participants. So if we're not even mentioning and describing who's participating in research um, in our journal articles, then it's very difficult to answer that fundamental question about what exactly do our research findings um, say and who are they saying it about. I'm going to wrap that up in a tidy fashion and end there and look forward to discussion among the other speakers. Thank you. continue to be uh, amazed and in awe of the uh, folks who chose to spend their time with us here today. Um, I want to turn to our respondents, and our respondents for this session are Julia Bascom, Emily Titan, and ask if either of you would be willing and interested to kick off our group discussion on our last panel. Um, <laughs> microphone feedback. There was some really great, specific, specialized, really valuable information. Um, I'm going to talk about some more common themes that sort of arose from the discussions. And normally, I'd apologize for the amount of scripting I'm about to do, but 
all you guys who need to be doing it too, so I'm not going to feel bad at all. Um, the first issue I wanted to raise is that um, what research or theory or law indicate is not necessarily or even often what is actually practiced. Like, I'm from New Hampshire. I'm very proud that my state passed the restraint and seclusion law that we did, but I know kids who still have restraint in their IEPs and who are restrained in residential facilities. Um, um, in the discussion about pharmacological interventions, um, off-label use was raised. I know people who take SSRIs because it reduces um, hand flapping, for example. Um, and I think that this points to the reason why we need a comprehensive set of ethics for intervention because science doesn't occur in a vacuum as much as we wish it did. Um, and then the second point that was raised, um, I believe both in the presentation on prenatal and genetic information and on pharmacological um, knowledge was um, the people making these decisions with huge ethical implications are not necessarily or even often the same people as the ones affected as the ones affected, okay. Um, and the people who are making the decisions, it's not just that they're not affected, but the people who are affected are affected primarily and irreversibly. You can't undo something. Um, a parent can decide that they don't want their child to receive an intervention anymore and stop paying for it, but the child never gets to not experience that, to not have experienced that. Um, it's not a theoretical question for autistic people. The theory is fascinating and I love it, but there's also the fact that it has huge real life implications and that can lead to serious safety, uh, serious safety concerns, which um, Samantha did a really good job talking about and which several presenters have brought up. Um, in addition, um, a lot of research, and this is also been raised by a couple of different presenters, um, focuses on efficiency, but not necessarily towards what end. If um, various interventions can lead to um, serious safety concerns, to people who are fundamentally insecure on basic cognitive levels, to trained passivity, um, but if the goals of the intervention, such as um, appearing indistinguishable to one's peers are reached, it's going to be judged to be an efficient study and an effective intervention. Um, um, I'd like to note that um, Paul Shattuck actually had some great recommendations about how to affect what the research goals are and looking at different um, services and across the lifespan. Um, and then, particularly with the, pharma, with the um, presentation on pharmacological interventions, um, issues of consent were raised. Um, not only talking about non-consensual usages of medications versus restraint, but also about the power, differential, power differentials. Um, several different people have mentioned that you know, children under our legal system are presumed incompetent. Um, but then that assumption gets carried over to adults with disabilities um, who may never be given the chance to consent. And then when they are given that chance, if as a result of how adults with disabilities um, experience interventions or experience whatever they experience, um, they may have degrees of trained pass passivity or installed insecurity, trauma responses, or just the basic assumption that you should always say yes when someone asks you to do something or the person in the lab coat is always going to be right. And therefore, getting meaningful and authentic consent is a huge ethical concern. Um, and then there are also issues of accessibility, of communication. If the person doesn't have a working communication device or if the question they're asked is not phrased in language they can understand, how can you obtain consent? Um, and that, again, ties also, when you're talking about issues of consent, you need to think about, again, dignity of risk. Um, and if someone wants to take a risky intervention, if that should be allowed, if we really believe that people can meaningfully consent, then that should also be an option. And I have run out of things to say, so I'm gonna give it to Emily, I think. Oh, 
move it? Closer, yes. Okay, um, so I took down a lot yeah, of can notes. Can people hear Emily now? And, um, let's see, about the genetic testing, is it right? Um, and the it was the parent's sole decision. So if we're doing, changing the genetics of the population, if we're going to be in the future fooling around with that, is, um, is that right? Is it good? Is it what society would ultimately want now um, or then? Um, these are kind of out of order for some reason. Um, trying to figure out where I was. Um, Sam was saying something about the exploitation of trained passivity, which goes along with what Julia was saying about children who come up and they're raised you know, and they are sent to programs where they have applied behavioral an analysis used on them and it makes people very passive and as she was saying, very prone to just saying yes and doing whatever they're told. You know, the person, the teacher, the adult is always right and um, that continues right through adulthood when people go into adult services and then it's does people um, you know are their needs being served by that um, this concept of caregivers belief in their own benevolence therefore it wouldn't occur to them to think that what they're doing could possibly be wrong or bad or mean in any uh, way that's what they know and what they've been trained so that's what they believe is right and um, the same thing with aversive and, um, you know, giving people medication that medicalize it, medicates away flapping, which is, you know, a regulatory thing and um, it's actually a good thing for people with autism or autistic people to flap and, um, but they don't see it that as such. They see, tend to see it as a behavior, something that need, you know, this person's upset, they're flapping and no matter how often you know, you can tell them that they don't always listen and see it as a good thing. So I think part of what I wanted to say is that we really need to start including people um, in the conversation, not just people really need to be part of the conversation and not just part of it, but heard and listened to and um, yeah. Very well spoken. Let me, um, let me follow up on that by posing a question to the rest of our participants. Um, I think one of the common themes that, that ran through this, this panel's presentations and, and both Emily and Julia's remarks about them was this idea that, you know, once research is conducted, um, it's very difficult to have some degree of control over how it's utilized um, or its implications. Research is very frequently um, kind of a fire and forget phenomena, phenomena or maybe publish and forget phenomena in that um, the implications of research and how it's used aren't always uh, sufficiently considered um, through the process of picking what will be researched and conducting that research and then after the publication itself. Um, to what degree do you think we can address that topic within the context of some of the top issues that were thrown out on this panel? Prenatal testing, pharmacology, aversives, um, issues around diversity. Uh, how do we change the dynamic beyond one of publish and forget to one in which researchers need to take some degree of social responsibility for the implications of their work? I think I had the microphone too close before, so hopefully this is a little bit better. Sorry before if I, one of my previous comments. Um, you can hear me all okay with at the distance? Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I think that one quick thing that I'd like to say about that is that I think part of this is the training process. I mean, my feeling is that doctoral students, before they become, say, doctor, you know, researchers with PhDs, are not always trained that well on the value judgments and ethics and all the different things that we are talking about today. Um, so I think we need to be m making inroads and to be adding that to um, training for, for doctoral students, for PhD students, and maybe MD researchers who are going to be going out and doing research. Anybody who is being trained in graduate education for research should be having um, training and learning about, thinking about these things so when they go about doing research and publishing, 
that this is in the forefront of their mind, not just a little thing in their, in their mind, but this is something in there. And I, I, I don't know how we go about doing that as much as just putting this conversation forward and connecting with universities around the country, for instance, on, on making sure this is something they prioritize in, in training of doctoral students. I sense somehow that Alan has something to say. First, I would really second that comment about how important it is um, that this be part of research training. Uh, and in certain areas of research, obviously, even more important than others. But I, I, um, there's a trend towards it, but it's uh, too small a trend. Uh, and I think that's a very important point. The second thing is I would absolutely agree that researchers bear some responsibility for the uses of their research. But also, while one can think of dramatic examples where that those future societal implications should have been clear before the, institute was, the research was even instituted, for much, much research, the ultimate uses, the ultimate implications of that research really cannot be figured out ahead of time, or even at the time it's published or whatever. Um, and certainly, uh, particularly the long-term consequences, et cetera. So at the same time, I think that people need to be aware of that and take that in consideration. Again, there are limits of knowledge here, too. There are real limits about being able to understand what the full implications of and how the information will be both used and misused uh, in the future. That doesn't, I think, um, take away the onus of responsibility, but to recognize how much of a challenge it can be in a lot of research anyway. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that I think this is, to answer your question, this is probably one of the reasons why um, we've been talking about community-based research so much. Um, that can change how the questions are framed and what standards are used to evaluate the research. And then if the community that's being affected by the research is invested in the research questions, I think you'll see more natural kind of a follow-up. Um, that's it. Oh, yep, Sue. And then Stephen. I am very grateful for the reference to um, international human rights treaties and conventions. I would point us, perhaps as a basis for some of this training, to the promise that the United States made when it was a signatory to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and uh, which I feel has not been fulfilled at all throughout our educational system. But the res the, the uh, responsibility that we took on then was to teach human rights everywhere, uh, in our schools, in our universities, in the highest order classes, in the most basic courses um, that children take. I, I have an app on my iPhone with the uh, Universal Declaration. <laughs> Allow me to just read Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Uh, the rest of the articles go on in similarly important ways. The most important aspect of human rights, I think, is not that these are rights that are granted to humans, but they are rights that are granted by humans. So in order to experience our own full humanity, we need to understand these principles. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to Shane for bringing it up. There's a general trend that autistic people with milder social symptoms and also sometimes with higher measured IQ, and there are all sorts of problems with IQ, of course, but um, are to have, high, have lower self-esteem, 
um, higher anxiety, depression, more likely to be victimized by peers, um, with not just that less likely to be protected and more likely to be in inclusive settings, maybe, but that um, this kind, it's kind of this oversimplified like medical versus moral model, and if there's anything good about the so-called medical model, it's that, you know, what Samantha talked about, about the relief of, you know, moral judgment. Um, but, you know, if someone seems like that they're intentionally behaving in some sort of unusual way, but they're just weird rather than, you know, disabled, um, then people are more likely to think, oh, it's okay to pick on this person, et cetera. And so, but with the, you know, the implications being for, for example, a drug intervention or treatment for, say, social symptoms of autism, um, and so far there's been none that have been shown to be at all, well, I mean, consistently shown to be effective, and oxytocin I was alluded to as um, something that people are looking at now, and there's mixed evidence, I suppose. And well, well, and that's actually also something to be, to think about how people are, you know, having different kinds of neurochemistry and how they're wired, and that even with oxytocin, the general population, that actually, when it's tested, I mean, um, when people, oxytocin levels are actually related to less empathy for out groups. Like it's more out, us versus them thinking and maybe having more socially stereotyped versions of sympathy toward people that you know and are familiar to you. Um, and of course, disabled people are all sorts of, in all sorts of ways are often made into some sort of subspeciation thing that Anne talked about. Um, but, um, and so actually if an, a disabled person seems to show as much empathy as someone else, does that mean that we actually biologically might have more be, if we see ourselves as somehow different? But anyway, but, um, but so maybe autistic people's attention to detail where we take things more maybe on a case by case basis viewing things, analyzing them more systematically, um, may, where, where non-autistic people may be more likely to view things at a more generic, to, to develop kind of oversimplified rules that often are somewhat useful and they approximate reality or whatever, but actually are, are the same kinds of thinking that can lead to stereotypes about people. And so, you know, when, so some of the areas where non-autistic people might be seen as more social, there actually are disadvantages of that. And are we actually making autistic people more likely to stereotype and this other, but it's also, you know, we know from research autistic people are more um, sensitive to side effects. And so if something would be effective anyway, would probably be at a lower dose. Um, and a lot of people have a bias that if something's not working, they just want to apply more, but that's more of a practice versus research, I suppose, so. bias. And so, and then if the goal is to reduce social symptoms, I'm saying that it might actually lead to more peer victimization, overall reduced mental health, and it probably then would be much more. So we, we need to wrap up. To, to to last last point, last point, and, very brief, because we need to and wrap And also, up. what are we really measuring we should measure things like friendship quality and quality of life, subjective well-being, and not just whether someone appears more typical, and that would be how you might measure a drug study on supposedly social areas, which is, I think, I, a very dangerous I think dangerous that's area. an excellent point to end on. With that in mind, I want to thank our audience for joining us. We're going to reconvene at 2.15. Um, uh, if our participants can meet me in the coffee slash lunchroom over there, we're going to um, pass out lunch and figure out where we're all going for our working lunch sessions. And um, for our audience members, thank you all very much, and I'll see you in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay.